Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC212, on BC Christian Apologetics. Um, we just gone through in our first lecture on the canon of scripture, how the scriptures came together, how it put together for us. Any questions from anyone on that? I know uh, you may have gone through this information earlier, but any questions? All right. So the next thing we want to understand is about translation and right? how are these translations done and what are the difference between all these different English versions, English translation and English versions of the Bible. So let's talk about that a little bit. Share the PDF. All right. So, you know, when we look at so many different translations, um, first of all, people will look at the translations, different versions, sometimes even for us as, as believers. Uh, some translations or some versions of the English Bible. Uh, don't seem to say the same thing. They don't seem to convey the same thing in the, in the English language. So why is there this difference? And that can be very confusing. The second problem is also that uh, in some versions, uh, there would be certain texts that are missing. You know, so why is that? You know, why is that? King James, New King James have these verses and certain texts, the most recent ones would not have it and so on. Or why would they put it in the footnote separately? Right? What, what, is, what, what is the significance of it? So both to answer both these questions, we need to understand how and why there are so many English versions of the Bible. Um, so basically, uh, there are two things. One is there are two two important things we must understand. When when so when translations of the Bible are being done, usually most often, and I'm not saying all of this because there are some instances where a single individual has worked on the translation, but usually. Uh, there's a group of translators, people who are well-versed in Hebrew, other group, and somebody, a group who are well-versed in Greek, and so on, who will be a team of people working together on the translation. Right? So the translators, whether it's an individual or a group, have to decide on two things. First, they have to decide on uh, what what which set of manuscripts are they going to use or how are they going to use these manuscripts right so for the old and the new testament how are they going to work with these manuscripts second they, they have to decide on what we refer to as the translation philosophy i mean who are they translating for and what is what are they trying to achieve through their translation in the english language so the, the translators think about these two things. Now, when we talk about manuscripts, broadly speaking, there are two sets of manuscript families. One is referred to as the majority text. The other one is the neutral or Egyptian text. So what is the difference? Um, the majority text, that translation approach is the translators are going to include what is found in the majority of the manuscripts. They're going to work with that. The neutral or the Egyptian is, we are going to include what was in the oldest, that is the, the date of the manuscript, what was in the closest, the oldest of the manuscript in depending on so was it close to where it came from, where things happen. So one is looking at the majority text. That means, is this text 
found in the majority of the manuscripts. Another is looking at the time and the location. Is it what 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 is what is text that is closest to the original, and is it from that part of the work? Because you know manuscripts maybe started off with Hebrew and Greek, and then there were other regional languages into which these manuscripts were translated. Um, you find them here, uh, Syriac and Coptic and Latin and Aramaic and Greek, of course. So there were, you know, regional languages into which these manuscripts were translated. So you want to know, are these really close to the original and to the location in which um, uh, the actual writing took place. So you will find that in certain Bibles, they will say, MSS, the majority of the text, the majority text has this or does not have this. Right. So that means they're saying, look, we are we are doing, we are using this neutral type of work, and this is not found in majority text. This is informing us that it is there in the oldest version, but it's not in the majority text. Things like that. They are, the, 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 the translators are have made a choice what set of manuscripts they're going to use, but they're also cross-referencing and telling us that hey. This is found in the oldest text, but it's not found in the majority text. It's not every text, every manuscript does not contain this portion. So on that basis, you will find that if somebody is using the majority text, you will find that they may omit something that was found in the oldest text, but it's not found in the majority text. So they will make that, but they will let you know, they'll put a note saying, okay, it's not found in the majority text, so we have left it up. So that's the reason you have certain portions of scripture left out based on the different types of manuscripts they're using, or that's why you'll have footnotes that say, this is found here, but it's not found in that majority text. We have included it, but we're letting you know it's not found in the majority text, things like that. And so it's good to read the footnote and so you understand, okay, the translators have made some decision here on what to include, what not to include. But remember that this is also this is on a very small portion of text. It's not like the Bible is filled with these things, you know. Here and there you'll find certain uh, uh, no footnotes that say this is what has happened. Another important criteria that is the translation philosophy that determines how something is translated. So in translation philosophy, there are at least five major categories. The first one is what is referred to as formal equivalence. That means we are going to do word for word, right? So if that word is in Greek or Hebrew, we will translate it into the corresponding words in English. And in order to make the sentence read well, we will introduce some words. But if we introduce some words, which we will try not to do, but if we have to, we will put that in italics. In other words, but otherwise, we are going to stay with the original text. So this is formal equivalence. It's a word for word translation, and you have you know the uh, English Standard Version, King James, New American Standard Bible, these fall into that category. Then there is functionally so thought for thought. So here the translator is not doing a word for word translation. They're saying, okay, we are going to understand what the writer was thinking, and we're going to tell you in English what the writer was thinking. Okay? So this is usually, uh, there is a little interpretive process involved uh, where the translators are saying, this is what the writer was thinking, and I'm telling you what the writer was thinking in English. Okay? Um, the goal is 
We want to make it easier for you to understand. Read and understand. Easy. Just try to, that's the goal. So the thought for thought translation. And some of these, yeah, you living translation, NRE, come in this category. But understand that in thought for thought, there is an interpretive process that's happening by the translators. They are understanding what was written. They are then saying, here's what the writer was thinking and telling it to you. Now, there's another approach, which is trying to go in between. Uh, they're trying to say, well, we want to do word for word, and at the same time, we want to do thought for thought. Right. means we, we're translating word for word. At the same time, we're translating it in a way that we will tell you what the writer was thinking when he was using that word. So this is an optimal equals word for word and thought for thought. Okay. So you have some Bibles that come into that category, also known as optimal. It's word for word, thought for thought. Then there is meaning for meaning. Right? So now we are going one level higher, which is not just word for word, it's not thought for thought, but it's meaning for meaning. This is what he meant. So I'm telling you what he meant. Right? So example, the Passion Translation is trying to do that there. And it is very helpful because they're kind of not only interpreting, but they're also explaining. Right? So in thought for thought, we are doing a little bit of interpretation. In meaning for meaning, we are interpreting and explaining a little bit. And they're communicating it to the listener, English, in the English language, meaning for meaning. And finally, there is a paraphrase. The paraphrase is more like, let me give you a summary of what was being said. You know, so it's not word for word, not necessarily thought for thought, meaning for meaning. It's like, okay, I will tell you in my words, in very easy to understand English, a summary of what was being said. So we're going another level away from the original text, but there is a reason why all, all of this is happening. Right? So the motivation, so the, the motivation in, 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 in these uh, translations is we want to help the reader understand, right? We want to help the reader. We want to make it easy for them to understand. And so if you look at this, uh, this little chart here, it's very useful. So on the left side, if you think there is, this is the original text, whether in Hebrew or Greek or Arabic, yeah. And Here's the whole range of translations. Um, the word for word is okay. This word is there in Greek. I will give you the equivalent, the the the, the word in English or words for that word, single word if, if it needs more words in English. And only in order to make things easier, I will introduce you know additional words and I'll identify that if I put it near the words. So you have interlinear, which is basically exactly word for word. They don't they don't even put it into uh, English sentence. It's just this word, this word right here, interlinear. Right? And then you have New American, amplify uh, the English standard version, the uh, revised standard version, King James, New King James. So these four Bibles are in this word for word translation process. Then slowly I'm moving into thought for thought, right? The um, Hoffman Christian Standard Bible, 
the neuro standard version, the New American Bible, Jerusalem Bible, the International Version, and the New the, uh, today's International Version, New Century Version. Thought for thought. Right. So now there's a little more interpretive process. Then as you come in here, meaning for meaning, uh, we get into these versions, New Living Translation, and uh, and so on, Passion Translation, so on. And then you come on the other end of the spectrum, which is the Message Bible, the Living Bible, Message Bible, Contemporary English Version, our paraphrase. That means we're giving you an essence of it, what they said, what was being said. It's kind of a summary of what was being said. Now, the motivation behind these translations is in the paraphrase, we just want to make it simple, as simple as possible for the reader and make it as simple as possible, make it easy for them to read, make it, you know, very engaging, uh, put it in contemporary language and even use, uh, you know, uh, even include uh, illustrations that are from modern day. So put it in, in, in a way that a modern day user can understand. Whereas, uh, and so then you have thought for thought, meaning for meaning is, okay, let's help the reader understand, give, you know, this is what's the thought, this was the meaning. In word for word, the goal is, hey, we want to stay close to the original text. We let the reader do the work of understanding, interpreting, and, you know, uh, uh, deciding how to work with the text. But our goal is to be close to the original structure and form of the text. Right? So that's the reason why we have this whole range of scripture. And, you know, so obviously the question is, uh, uh, so that helps understand, you know, uh, why there could be variations in how that same verse is reading differently in different versions, because in a word-for-word -word translation, they've just given you the literal words. Whereas in a thought-for-thought, -thought, a meaning-for-meaning, meaning, there's been some interpretation that has already taken place. So uh, they have kind of changed it to say, this is what we think the writer is saying, or this is the meaning of what he was saying. So it may come out differently. And in a paraphrase, it's really further away. It's like, okay, they're giving a summary. So, so when you read, you know, these different bi uh, versions of the bi English Bible, it looks so different because of the way in which they have worked on the original text to make it easy for the modern reader. But this leads us to the question I was going to mention, which is, you know, means, okay, which is the right version to use? Well, it really depends on what the the goal is. If you're, you know, if you're reading, if you're, if somebody's a new believer and they just want to get an idea of what, what is the Bible, what is the New Testament, or what is the Bible, then you would, and if they don't want to get into some heavy studying on that, then yeah, we would say, okay, why don't you start with some easy to read paraphrase, or uh, if they're able to handle, uh, if their English is good and they're able to handle it, we can say, okay, why don't you do a thought for thought, like an NID or something. Uh, but for those of us who are who want to study, who want to get in, you know, we can we will go into the Hebrew and the Greek ourselves, and we want to do a word for word. Then, yeah, then for us, yeah, a, a word for words is very very useful. Right, you're getting closer to the original text, so you know this word it is. So usually, uh, and I'll share with you uh, how I approach this. So when I'm studying, I will use, I will study usually with the New King James, um, and I will look up the Hebrew or the Greek for what I'm studying, and then I will also try to read across this range, across the spectrum, you know. And and then of course today because we have software, we can do that very very easily. So I'll click on a verse and I'll say I'm going to read this verse and all the other other versions. So I will see how this verse, one verse, is, is, has been translated in many different versions. So it gives me a broader understanding. It also helps me how to communicate this to a modern audience. So I'll go into the Hebrew and Greek because I want to understand, you know, the, 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 because that one Hebrew word can have, or Greek word can have multiple meanings. 
And so I want to understand that. And so it gives me good grip on this was what was said. And now how do I communicate all of that to the audience today? So reading other versions and looking at you know other words, other ways of saying it helps. So then I will quickly read through all the other versions. And it's so easy to do these days because of, you know, we have software to do help us. We can read through all the other versions and say, okay, this is how I can communicate the thought. What was it, what is originally stated? This is how I can present it to the audience. So it kind of gives you a good grip. It also gives you a lot of confidence when you're speaking because you have studied right from the original text. So you know that this is what the original text said. You know, I'm not speaking based on a paraphrase or I'm not even speaking based on a meaning for meaning rendering. I have gone to the original text. I've read the Hebrew, I've read the Greek, I've seen what those words mean. So I, you, know, you can speak with a lot of authority, a lot of confidence You're coming from that level. And then of course you're communicating it in a very simple manner. So it makes it easy for people to understand. So for those of us who uh, are, are going to be preaching, teaching, ministering in English, uh, I would say, you know, make take advantage of all of the versions that are there. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a big blessing. Uh, we start from uh, a study of the Hebrew, the Greek words, and then take advantage of all the modern translations uh, so that it helps us communicate to the uh, modern audience. Right? So you have all of these things. Let me pause and uh, let me see if there are any questions here. Okay. Okay. Um, so Chaya's question is Torah and the Bible. Yeah. So the first five books, it's it's just a name given to that collection. Couple, the collection of the first five books, Torah, and it was a name given by the Jewish people, the Hebrews. We don't use it. Like, you know, when we say, we don't say turn to the Torah, you know, we don't say, we don't use that. It's, it was just used by the Jewish people. So we, as believers, we say Old Testament, use New Testament, right? And, uh, um, and the first five books of Moses are part of the Old Testament. The, the term Bible refers to the whole collection of Old and New Testament, these 66 books. Okay, so there's no problem. Um, the word Torah is just something they use. We don't use it. We, we don't, don't normally hear about any, you know, we don't say, please turn to the Torah, we don't say it. We just say, we refer to the name of the book of the Bible and turn there. Yeah. Um, translation, transliteration. So, um, so another question here is, there was a difference in the terms translation and transliteration. So uh, as I understand it, translation, you know, is an attempt to go from one language to the other. Uh, while trying to stay as close to the original text. That's the, the goal of the translator. Transliteration is, it's giving you a little bit more liberty. That means I'm not doing a word for word or literal translation, but I, there's a more freedom. I am translating, but I am uh, also interpreting it to the, uh, to the reader. Transliteration and making it easy for my reading. So I think that would be the, uh, you know, in general speaking, you know, this is what we would understand the difference between translation and transliteration. But um, again, depending on the context and who's saying this, we can, uh, we can, uh, it may mean something different. Um, Ren, what about using ESO? Yeah. Like we mentioned in a first year class on hermeneutics, I mean, uh, we shared uh, you know different software tools that we could use and uh, I recommended Eastwall, uh, which is something I use. 
Uh, of course, there are a lot of other tools, and some people are more comfortable with other tools like uh, the Blue Letter Bible or Logo software. Uh, some people even use the online Bible Gateway. So a lot of other tools, online software tools that people use. Uh, so yeah, you could use any one of these um, to study, to look up, study Hebrew, Greek, and Greek commentaries and so on. Just another question. Also in scriptures, there's a lot of difference in the meaning. Yeah, that's true. An example, you shall be my witnesses, translates to us as we have to be a testimony. He also means same thing. When it comes to Greek, it means the word martyrs, meaning being a martyr. How do we understand this from the original language? It was written. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so let's say, uh, let's take an example, right? Um, the example here, the Greek word, you shall be my witnesses. Um, the word witness, like in the Greek, um, is is martyr or somebody who's, you know, who gives his life, as we understand, gives their life for the gospel, but also means somebody who is testifying to, speaking up for, you're testifying to, giving evidence to something that you have witnessed. So the translator has to decide, how do I put this in English? And how do we, how do we, uh, you know, how do we put it in English? Now I can't say, you shall be my martyrs, or should I say you shall be my martyrs, or should I say you will give evidence to be a witness? So it will, then depend on the context, right? Because a Greek word could have multiple meanings. So you would, the translator would say, okay, the right way to do this is, you shall be my witness. So that's the English word that corresponds to the Greek word martyr, because that's the right, in the context, that's what Jesus is saying, you are witnesses of these things. So you're gonna give evidence to these things. Right. So um, when we study the Greek word, then we understand, oh, the word martyrs is used, which literally means martyr. We understand that Jesus is saying, give evidence to, and that's also one of the meanings of the word martyr, martyrs. But we also understand the word martyrs me could mean martyr. So studying the Greek, or going back to the original text in Hebrew Greek, kind of opens up our understanding of that verse a lot more. And we say, okay, it, we know in the original context of how it was spoken, this is what it meant. That means give evidence to be a witness. But we also know in the usage of the word, the meanings could be brought, that the, re, the listeners understood it much more than what the way it was translated. So we can bring that out in our preaching and teaching and say, hey, if you were a listener, and you heard Jesus saying, you will be my martyrs. For the listener, listening to what Jesus was saying, they would have understood it in an inclusive sense, meaning, hey, he's telling me I should give witness to, and I may even have to give my life up for him. That's how the listener would have understood it. But that doesn't come out in the English translation. The English translation says will be my witness which is one aspect of the meaning uh, the meaning that is taken in the context of what was being said but it does leave out the other aspect of that the Greek word but when we go and study the Greek we understand the broader meaning and then that helps us in our preaching and teaching and explaining of the scripture so that's that's a benefit of going back and studying right but that's also the limitation of translation. Uh, now the Amplified Bible tried to work around that by, you know, using the parenthesis saying, this word also means these, 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 these things, right? Uh, a classic example is in the Greek word parakletos. King James, New King James is translated as comforter. But hey, comforter is only one of the seven 
meanings of the word parakletos. So the amplified Bible will put all the other singular words, parakletos, comforter, parenthesis, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, counselor, you know, all the other meanings. So the Amplified Bible is trying to tell us that the Greek word actually has more than one meaning. Uh, and it means all this, right? So, uh, but then it makes it the Amplified. I mean, it's, 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 it becomes very big to read, but it's very useful. So that's the advantage of going back and looking into the Hebrew and the Greek and saying, hey, this word could also mean these things. And in the ears of the listener, they understood it like that. And so we can bring it out today when we preach. All right, next question is... Mm. Let me... So, um, the... the the, we saw this just recent, I mean, just a couple of pages back, uh, Chaya, the word Bible, right? It's given there on page, um, page 53, I think it is. Uh, where is this? Yeah, page 53, the meaning of the Biblia, the books. Right? So Bible, singular, the book. Biblia, the books. So the meaning of the word Bible is the book. The book. So it's Holy Bible, the Holy Book. Um, could you please refer us to some commentaries that we can use? So commentaries, are okay, there are so many different commentaries. Uh, my suggestion would be uh, don't read too many commentaries. Stay with one or two. Um, the uh, ones I would recommend the big I care I think that's the name of spelling David Kazik to use I'm not hundred percent sure of the spelling and uh, let me just check it uh, David to use I care yeah so David Kazik commentary um is something I would recommend, uh, simply because he comes from a spirit-filled uh, perspective. So um, the problem with, with the commentaries is, as with any commentary, uh, it's the, the commentator's perspective. So if the commentator is a spirit-filled Pentecostal, you know, by, you know, that type, so obviously the commentaries will come from that perspective. Uh, if the commentator is an evangelical, somebody who doesn't believe, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the gifts of the Spirit and so on, so they will come from that perspective. So David Kizik's commentary, uh, you you will find it within Eastward. So when you download Eastward, you could also download the commentary. You'll find it, or I think his commentaries are also part of Blue Letter Bible. So, um, yeah, just search for David gives a commentary, you'll find it. I mean, uh, if, you have, if you're using eSword, it's there, available for free. Uh, if you are not using eSword, you can, I think his commentary is also available on in the Blue Letter Bible. So that's one I would recommend. Uh, but again, uh, I, um, remember that any commentary is is a communication of the person doing the commentary, uh, his understanding and so on. So don't just take everything you read in the commentary. You've got to do your study. Uh, you've got to do your uh, analysis. And uh, don't and don't swallow everything you read in a commentary. Okay? Uh, yeah. All right. Anything else? Um, so Ren is asking, are commentaries similar to paraphrase? Mm, no. So commentaries are not translations. Uh, commentaries are almost like you could say uh, short sermons on based on the text, right? So that means the person writing the commentary is giving you some 
maybe an understanding of the text, their, their explanation, or sometimes they may include some background information. They may include some cross-references. They may, basically commentaries are explanations of text, but it doesn't only include explanation. They could in, include background information. They could include cross-referencing. Uh, they could include what other people have said on the text. So commentaries are helping you understand the text. Okay? Um, so they are different from paraphrase. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, there would be a lot more information, more like sermons based on the text. Okay? They're helping us understand the text and the chapter and the book and so on. Yeah. Okay, anything else? So in lesson number nine, in this lesson, we have um, tried to you know, understand some things, not necessarily everything, but some important things about the Bible. I'll just quickly close with a few comments here um, that um, there are the last two pages. Let me just go ahead and share it and we we'll finish this chapter and move on to the next. Yeah. So in closing, uh, some of the amazing things about the Bible is its unity. And so this is really amazing that especially in some important details, these 66 books, you know, written by 40 different authors across different cultures and different continents, they all said the same thing. You know, example, in terms of the origin of the universe, the existence of God, the nature of God, uh, they all said the same thing. You know, they're, they're writing the same thing. That's amazing. And especially talk about the tri triune God, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all saying the same thing. Uh, so the unity of this, these 66 books is amazing. Um, the historical and archaeological accuracy, that means when the Bible is talking about places, people, events, these things are, you know, are historic, historically proven. And there are also many of these things that are archaeologically proven, meaning, you know, some of these old historical cities you can go to and say, yeah, this was a city, this is where it happened. So the Bible is not like a, you know, a, 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 a legend or a story or a fable. There is, it's in many ways, these things actually happened. Right? So that's another thing, very important, very interesting. There is prophecy that's been fulfilled. Um, amazing prophecies, sound prophecies that had almost no chance of being fulfilled. For example, all the prophecies concerning Jesus, about 300 of them, the possibility that one human person living at one particular time would fulfill all of those prophecies was the chance was one in 10 raised to 157. Somebody calculated this. So in other words, it's like, hey, this is impossible, humanly speaking, that one person could fulfill all these prophecies in his life living on earth. But it happened. Unlike that, there are many other amazing prophecies that were fulfilled. It's indestructibility. So many people, like we said in the very beginning, some people have tried to destroy it, but the Bible has just increased like no other book on the earth. And it's Christ centeredness that means um, the Bible is 
focus on one person, the Messiah, and pointing to Jesus. Uh, the power of uh, the teachings of the Bible are uh, powerful, they're also timeless. So some people say the Bible is outdated. It's not outdated. You open it and read it and it's speaking to us today. You know, it was written thousands of years ago, but it's speaking to us today. It's still so relevant and it transforms lives. People's lives are changed as we read the scriptures. And so the Bible is so powerful and so amazing. Now, uh, I like this, um, you know, this is taken from the uh, Gideon's, uh, Gideon's Bible, I think they, they typically put this in, um, in, uh, in most of the New Testaments. It's beautiful uh, prose uh, talking about how the Bible, what the Bible is to us today. Okay. So we'll stop, we'll pause with that. We'll get now into, okay, let me just introduce what we're going to do in the next lesson. So the next few lessons um, would be focusing about the person of Jesus. And what we want to do is we want to help understand ourselves, why Jesus Christ is unique, why do we say there's no one else like Jesus? There's so many religions, so many, you know, uh, gurus or people living, um, religious leaders, so on and so forth. But what makes Jesus different? Why is he unique? And then we also want to talk about the credibility of his resurrection. That means, you know, we are saying that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. How do we know that's credible? Because we were not there. This happened 2,000 years ago. How can we defend or explain to somebody who questions the resurrection of Jesus? So we'll talk about that. And then we want to talk about how do we communicate Jesus to other religions, to people, especially from the Hindus and the Muslims. So the next few lessons. I'm going to focus on the person of Jesus Christ, his uniqueness, his resurrection, the message we present, and how do we communicate him, the message of Jesus to people of other religions. Right? So we'll do that. Then after that, we'll get into questions on social issues. And then after that, we'll talk about suffering and you know, uh, questions around suffering. So that's kind of the direction we're going now uh, in, in the weeks to come, right? Any questions before we close today? All right. I hope you um, everyone's learning something. You're uh, getting questions answered and uh, these things are useful. Uh, as you prepare to talk to other people and share with other people and, um, you know, uh, help other people come to explore Jesus, explore the Christian faith. Okay, let's close for today. I just request somebody to pray and then we will dismiss. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please? Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord. Father, to know how to understand and read from the scriptures, Lord, what you have for us today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord. Father, even as this time, whatever that you have taught us, Lord, help us to put it into practice, Lord. Help each of us, Lord, from where we are, Lord, to begin, Lord. And also, Lord, to understand more of you, Lord Jesus, from the scriptures, Lord, so that it may be a blessing to others. And also, Lord, our life will be a meaningful one on our Jesus. Help us, Lord. Bless each one of us present here, Lord. In Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. Bye now.